The Life and Times of T. Boone Pickens In the winter of 1984, war was declared on the town of Bartlesville, Oklahoma. When the alarm was raised, the locals saw their beloved home resting on a nice edge. Some took to churches to attend 24-hour vigils, praying that the attacker would leave them alone. Others walked around in t-shirts with wartime slogans plastered all over the front. All the while, local leaders held rallies, warning the entire city might fall if the attacker managed to seize control of the industrial fortress at its heart, Phillips Petroleum. The enemy at the gate wasn't the Soviets, or some domestic terrorists, or a gang of bandits. Actually, it was just one man, an unassuming oil man from Oklahoma via Texas by the name of T. Boone Pickens. Hardly sounds like a threatening guy, but his was a name which once drove terror into the hearts of corporate management throughout the American oil industry. In 1984, it was the CEO of Phillips Petroleum's turn to start shaking. So how did one man have the power to stir up such dread among Bartlesville's corporate overlords? Basically, it was because he was a 20th century's grand master of a bold and ballsy business battle plan, the hostile takeover. This new brand of warfare would come to define the legacy of T. Boone for years to come. Some saw him as a Wall Street pirate, others as a freedom fighter on the side of the little guy. Whatever the case, the threat he posed was very real. If the managers of Big Oil never did enough for their shareholders, this corporate martyr might light a very expensive fire underneath them. It was battles like this one which made him a finance legend, who rubbed shoulders with the best of the best. God-tier investor Warren Buffett was a buddy, who said of our man, they grow big personalities in Texas, but none could top Boone. I never was with him that it wasn't fun. Today, we'll be doing a deep dive into how that big Texas personality came to be and the impact it left upon the world of oil and money. It's not as simple a story as you might expect. Boone was a man who played a wide range of roles in his lifetime, enterprising wildcatter, ruthless corporate privateer, loose-fisted philanthropist, and finally, an unlikely environmentalist. And it all started, as all these stories tend to, in the dust and dirt of the American South. Wildcatter Rising Born on May 22, 1928, Pickens arrived on Earth just in time to enjoy everything the Great Depression had to offer. He spent his childhood in his hometown, Holdenville, Oklahoma, which he once described as that wide expanse where the pavement ends, the west begins, and the Rock Island crosses the Frisco. The vast cattle fields around Holdenville were already littered with oil derricks by this time and his own father, Thomas Boone Sr., worked in the industry as a land lease broker. Thomas the Elder had once made a minor fortune flipping drilling rights around the state, and then lost that fortune just as quickly on a series of bad gambles. These things happen. Sr.'s wife, on the other hand, was a lot more level-headed with the family's finances than her chronic gambler of a spouse. During World War II, she served as the town's gas rationing manager. T. Boone Jr. would later say on his personal website, I was very fortunate in my gene mix. The gambling instincts I inherited from my father were matched by my mother's gift for analysis. This balance of traits first paid off for Pickens when he was just 12 years old, working as a paperboy. At first, his own route consisted of just 28 houses, but he quickly increased that to 156 by simply buying out all the paperboys on the adjacent streets, probably for a couple of dimes and a pack of gum. That was my first introduction to expanding quickly by acquisition, a talent I would perfect in my later years. At the start of T. Boone's high school days, the family moved to Amarillo, Texas, which would become his spiritual hometown for the rest of his life. A few years later, his skill in basketball won him a college scholarship to Texas A&M, despite just being 5'8". There's hope for my NBA career after all. However, a broken elbow meant that Pickens' sporting ambitions fell apart shortly after they began, so he transferred to Oklahoma State. The administration of Texas A&M had no idea that cutting off the young Pickens would be, perhaps, the single most expensive mistake in their entire history. In later life, he would go on to donate hundreds of millions to Oklahoma State. On the Road to Riches By the time Pickens finished up his time at Oklahoma State, he had a bachelor in geology. 
and his first wife of many, his high school sweetheart, Len O'Brien. She was by his side as he started his first gig in the oil industry at a giant corporation based out of Bartlesville. Yes, the same one he would later wage war against in his corporate guerrilla days. It was back then in the 1950s that Pickens first identified how wasteful and lethargic Big Oil had become during his unhappy tenure at Phillips. All of his ideas were shot down by management, and every other day he'd come home complaining about wasting his life as a drone for risk-adverse old-timers. Almost four years at the firm, his wife Lynn said to him, if you hate it so much, why don't you just quit? Now that's a conversation that 99% of married couples have, but for T. Boone, it was a revelation. Shortly after, he had tendered his resignation, and with just $1,300 in severance pay, roughly about 13 and a half K today, he set out to become one of the last heroes of a dying breed, the American Wildcatter. Almost a hundred years after the start of the U.S. oil boom, Pickens was joining the long tradition of half-insane independent speculators, who struck out alone to win their millions. Gone were the days of horses and buggies. Our man instead bought a Ford station wagon with his severance pay, crammed all of his survey gear into the back, and started a new life on the road. Pulitzer Prize-winning writer Daniel Juergen said of his kind, Pickens was one of thousands driving around the oil states, using public phone booths as their offices, hustling, looking at deals, selling them, getting a crew together and well-drilled, and, if lucky, hitting oil or gas, dreaming all the while of making it big, really big. Or as Pickens later called it, picking with the chickens. And as it turns out, Pickens was no ordinary farm fowl. His background in geology and talent for analysis meant that within a year, he had amassed enough minor victories to secure $100,000 in credit, just over a million dollars today, to found his own firm named Petroleum Exploration. He would go on to invest much of that money further afield, in Canadian oil country dropping 35,000 on drill sites up there in 1959. By the 1960s, the payoff from his oil endeavors had made Pickens a multi-millionaire, and just a few years later in 1964, he went public with his second and most renowned company, Mesa Petroleum soon to be one of the largest independent oil and gas operations in America. The company would eventually grow their Canadian operation considerably, leading up to a cash out of a cool 600 million at the close of the 70s. And that's all it takes to become a petroleum millionaire from just a few thousand dollars. Easy enough, right? Buy a car, look at dirt, drill dirt, done. But before you go liquidating all your assets, I should warn you that those days are long behind us. In fact, Pickens' generation were already living through the dying days of the American oil man. The reason we're still talking about his legacy today isn't actually because of his oil finds. It's because he was one of the few of his kind who managed to survive the transition to the next phase of U.S. oil history and thrive. Pirate King of the Corporate World The Wildcatter game had been incredibly kind to Pickens over the years. But in the latter quarter of the 20th century, the prospects for independent oil speculators were looking increasingly grim. Pickens saw firsthand the dwindling oil reserves of the U.S. by the time he had started, while catters were often reduced to fighting over scraps. Big business was already drilling almost everywhere worth drilling. With the backing of world-class scientists and equipment, which the little guys just couldn't afford, in order to survive in this new world, our wildcatter would have to leverage his assets to become a fully-fledged business magnate. In the early 1980s, he declared, it has become cheaper to look for oil on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange than in the ground. That's why Pickens was never known for the cowboy boots and Stetson hats of most other Southern oil men. At the height of his fame, he was decked out in the attire of Wall Street, striped ties and expensive suits. He was part of a new breed of Southern businessman who retained the swagger and gambler spirit, but refined enough to navigate the world of the boardroom. Pickens himself was fond of impressing his peers with his patented plain spoken boonisms, such as, if you're gonna run with the big dogs, you have to get out from under the porch. And he was now very much ready to run with the big dogs. The shift in the market, which he was referring to, came when a supply shock saturated the world oil market in 1982, and prices of oil company stocks began to stagnate and decline. In Piggins' opinion, management practices had likewise grown stagnant, with high-paid corporate executives lacklusterly lording over companies in which they held little stake, 
He once declared, Chief executives who themselves own few shares of their companies have no more feeling for the shareholders than they do for baboons in Africa. Another boonism for you. At the same time, Pickens and his team of analysts at Mesa realized that the U.S. energy reserves were dropping. This meant that the market was yet to react to the impending tapering off of supply, meaning that oil stocks were trading at substantial discounts. The actual assets of big firms often dwarfed their meager share prices. Meaning, if one were to, for example, attempt to leverage this imbalance to take control of these big oil firms, then that individual would be able to acquire substantial oil holdings at far below their fair value. From then on, Pickens would be drawing value not from the ground, but tapping it from the treasuries of complacent oil executives who we thought were disconnected at best and incompetent at worst. Far better than scrapping around in the dirt for a few gallons a day, no? So, began the heyday of the corporate raiders, among whom Pickens was a bona fide pirate king. The Corporate Raiders Pocket Guide to Takeovers First though, if you're not familiar with what I mean by corporate takeover, let's take a very quick aside to explain. Who knows, maybe one day you'll want to launch some aggressive Wall Street warfare of your own. So, basically, since each share in a public company represents voting power in how said company is run, if someone were to acquire a majority of the shares, they would basically have the final say on every decision. That would give the majority shareholder the power to force a merger, even if that meant merging with their own firm. This can mean simply buying out existing shareholders for above market rate or exercising soft power to convince them to vote for your agenda. I would show them how I could make their stock dance, Pickens once said. At that point, the plebs like you and me have to pick their side, loyalist or rebel, pledge allegiance to the crown or cry off with their heads. The genius of it all is that the corporate raider doesn't even need to win the war to profit. They just need to scare the firm enough that they'll offer a bumper buyout package or work out some other deal so that the attacker will ultimately just surrender their shares in GTFO. T. Boone Pickens first cut his teeth at this aggressive maneuvering way back in 1968, just five years after taking his own firm public. At that point, Mesa was still small fry compared to the proper whales of American oil, which made it almost laughable when they tried to take on one of the giants of Kansas, a company called Hugoton Production. The bigger company's executives weren't laughing when Pickens swooped in to acquire 33% of their shares and garnered enough support to force through his hostile merger in April of 1969. His own website recounts that Pickens and his young band of hungry Mesa Petroleum managers grabbed a hold of a monster and shook it like it had never been jostled before. They rode that monster and got thrown some, but big oil was never the same again. ups and downs. That little showdown would serve as a warning for big oil in the years and decades to come. Underestimate the little shark, and he might just surprise you by swallowing the whales whole. With each subsequent deal, it became easier and easier to woo stockholders by showing them how much investors in previous targets had gained. Fast forward over a few more successful raids to the 1980s, the golden age of Wall Street, and our corporate martyr had blossomed into a veritable Gordon Gecko before Gordon Gecko was ever imagined into existence. Mesa now had the funds to launch ever more ambitious corporate raids with all the subterfuge and complexity of an actual war. For example, take a look at their campaign back in 82, when the self-proclaimed David aimed his sling at another corporate Goliath, City Services, also out of Oklahoma. For months, 
Mess's analysts gathered intel, then accumulated shares in the firm under the radar before setting up a forward operating base at a hotel off Wall Street and officially declaring their intentions. This would prove to be one of the biggest missteps of T. Boone's career. See, when one publicly traded firm launches a corporate takeover attempt on another, there's absolutely nothing to stop the target responding in kind. That's exactly the defense mechanism launched by City Services. Their annual sales dwarfed Pickens Mesa by a factor of 20, which meant they had the treasury to swing back, and then some. It was a long and expensive PR war, but Mesa eventually came out on top, just barely. City Services decided to run for help to Occidental Petroleum, who assimilated the firm and its holdings for $4 billion. It might have looked like a Pyrrhic victory, given how close Mesa came to destruction, but in reality, they still came out $31.5 million to the good, over $90 million today after their shares in City Services rocketed as a result of the merger. Hard to be upset with that kind of payday. The biggest beast yet. That's an impressive payday, but it wasn't the episode which cemented his status as a Wall Street legend once and for all. That would be his assault on energy behemoth Gulf Oil founded way back in 1907. To take on a giant like that, you need a lot of capital. In 1983, Pickens was able to muster together a whopping $1.3 billion of credit, worth almost three times as much today, raised from banks and fellow independents who headed out for big oil. In the beginning, Pickens and his team at Mesa made a bold assumption that Gulf Oil thought itself too big to be targeted, being one of the Seven Sisters oil multinationals. So they would be lax in setting up their defenses. And as Pickens' father always used to say, a fool with a plan can outsmart a genius with no plan. The prophecy turned out to be bang on. After an aggressive six-month campaign, launching mail and newspaper ads to trash the Gulf corporate management and promising their shareholders double-digit or even triple-digit gains, the executives at the enemy firm were forced to run into the arms of Chevron to rescue them from the invader and save their skins. The resulting buyout totaled $13.2 billion, the biggest in history at the time, equivalent to about $36.5 billion today, of which Pickens' firm, after all debts were paid off, personally benefited a cool $404 million, or $1.2 billion today. A pretty outstanding yield for all involved. Now, that's not to say that all went to the small-time investors who T. Boone claimed to represent. In reality, much of that sweet, sweet equity ended up in the hands of Wall Street arbitrage traders who bought shares following the declaration of war. They alone netted $300 million from the Battle of Gulf Oil and New York City itself benefited to the tune of $50 million simply from fees and taxes. Kind of ruins the whole Robin Hood image a little bit when the finance crowd are reaping the biggest benefits. But there were plenty of small investors who rode the wave along with them. Pickens would go on to pull off much the same with California's UNOCAL and a host of other firms throughout the years. By the time the dust had settled, he was the best paid executive in America and one of the richest men in the world. So the message is clear. If you're a small business owner who's struggling to get by, don't worry about your own balance sheets. Just threaten to take some other guy's stuff until he pays you to go away. Actually, I might have just described racketeering you might want to check with your lawyer first. Taking stock of the damage. By the midpoint of the 1980s, Pickens was one of the most celebrated names in American business. He landed himself a Time Magazine cover story which reported a stunning $900 million, $2.3 billion today, yield for Mesa across just the prior three years. He had slung mud at Giants and came out clean. Well, mostly. That last one actually ended up costing Mesa a cool $100 million when the Bartlesville firm successfully won over their shareholders and bought T. Boone out of that 10% loss. But let's not get hung up on that. Regardless, his rabbit attacks were enough to put the fear into many of the big oil firms like Texaco, Mobil, and Exxon, who look for strategic mergers to protect themselves from T. Boone and his kind. Overall, Pickens was celebrated as a pioneer of the shareholders' rights movement which set the playing field that most of corporate America inhabits today, where CEOs are expected to be invested financially, personally, in the fate of their company and its share prices. 
Seems like I'm stating the obvious, but that really wasn't the case for many big firms back in the day. His defeated enemies were not so enthusiastic about T. Boone's self-proclaimed activism. Chairman of uh, Gulf Oil, James Lee, called his approach hit-and-run tactics. City Services Executive J.C. Richardson claimed he was only after the almighty buck. I could find you a thousand more quotes from salty oil men who got a proverbial slapping around from Pickens. What they're all getting at is that he was more of a pirate than a freedom fighter, or to use the proper industry term, a green mailer. Whether you think he was a snake in the grass or a corporate messiah, the numbers are really all that matters. Pickens estimated that through just his highest profile raids in the early 80s, he had generated a staggering $12 billion, that's $30 billion today, in value from more than 750 small investors in his firms. I mean, it takes like an entire army of Reddit idiots to even come close to something like that. Life after Wall Street. By the mid-90s, Pickens was in his late 60s and sitting pretty on an empire of corporate holdings and extensive properties, including the obligatory massive Texas ranch, which every oil man needs, or can he even really call himself an oil man? His company Mesa, on the other hand, was not doing so hot. In 1996, Pickens was forced to sell the firm to investor Richard Rainwater and subsequently retired from the company. The oil man was already 68 years old, but rather than laying back on a pile of wealth and enjoying retirement, he decided to found Boone Pickens Capital Management a hedge fund geared towards the energy sector based in Dallas shortly after. Surprisingly, that didn't just include energy from fossil fuels. In his later years, the aging oil man was actually an unlikely ally for environmentalists in his promotion of solar and wind projects. Who would have thought that a wildcatter, Wall Street icon, and staunch Reagan Bush, Bush Jr., and Trump supporter would one day find himself on the same side of the battle lines as Greta Thunberg, we live in strange times. As you'd expect, his reasoning was perhaps more pragmatic than idealistic. Although he gave a nod to his new environmentalist buddies every now and then, Pickens' main goal was to reduce U.S. dependence on foreign energy. In 2007, he self-financed a massive U.S.-wide campaign of TV ads, speaking engagements, and congressional testimony with the goal of establishing total energy independence. Part of the plan focused on transitioning all public transport vehicles to compressed natural gas, which the U.S. had an abundance of despite dropping oil yields. And the other side of the proposal was $1 trillion of wind farm projects across the U.S., starting with the world's largest wind farm in the Texas Panhandle, which was unfortunately scrapped three years later. Although the whole thing gained some traction, it never really materialized in the way old Pickens had planned. Nonetheless, he would go on banging this drum for the rest of his days with mixed success. The first billion earned, the first given away. The Pickens plan might not have had quite the impact its namesake dreamed it would, but he did manage to make a significant impact in his old age through other means. For one, he became a bizarrely unlikely social media celebrity after a well-timed put-down on none other than Drake. Back in 2012, the rapper tweeted, The first million is the hardest. To which the 84-year-old hedge fund manager replied, The first billion is a hell of a lot harder. Tell me about it, T. Boone. I'm struggling to make a dent. One-upping a celebrity with a pitiful 150 million net worth was enough to win Pickens a new generation of admirers who weren't even born while he was tearing it up in the oil industry. These newfound fans would have been surprised that the next year would actually be his last on Forbes magazine's billionaire list. His personal wealth had peaked somewhere just shy of an estimated $2 billion, yet now he was suddenly sitting with less than half of that. So what happened? Bad run at the blackjack table? Did someone come and raid the raider? No, not quite. It was all a bit more heartwarming than that. At the time, Pickens tweeted an explanation to his followers saying, Don't worry. At $950 million, I'm doing fine. Funny. My $1 billion charitable giving exceeds my net wealth. Pickens was also clearly king of the humble brag, but I guess we can forgive him for that. I mean, he wasn't lying. He really did give away a full billion dollars to charity. At the request of his billionaire buds, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, Pickens had actually signed the Giving Pledge, a commitment to giving most of their wealth away to good causes. 
That's how Oklahoma State ended up with hundreds of millions. For athletic development alone, he donated a lump sum of $165 million in 2006, the largest single donation to any university's athletic department ever. Like I said before, kicking him out was a major mishap for Texas A&M. Beyond that, the rest went to at-risk kids, disaster relief, medical institutions, wildlife conservation, all that good stuff. Look, as a result, the net worth of T. Boone Pickens was slashed in half, and he was no longer a billionaire. The first billion might be the hardest to earn, but the first given away can basically evaporate overnight. Accepting the end. Moving on into 2017, the best of T. Boone Pickens' days were behind him. He finalized a divorce from his fourth wife in June that year, and just one month later suffered what he called a Texas-sized fall at his sprawling ranch, which for an 89-year-old is never a great sign. His health continued to decline from then on. In the winter, he decided to put up his ranch on the market for $250 million. Because what's the point in owning a ranch if you can't ride around ATVs and shoot rattlesnakes? Just one month after that, he announced that his hedge fund, BP Capital, would no longer be accepting new investments. After a series of strokes, it seems like the oil man once called the Oracle of Oil for his astute market analysis knew he was staring down the barrel of the end. A fact that he met head on with a post on his personal blog entitled Accepting or Embracing Morality. Definitely not the sort of reading to brighten up your day, but it's definitely worth a read. One of the best lessons found therein. There's a story I tell about the geologist who fell off a 10-story building. When he blew past the fifth floor, he thought to himself, so far, so good. That's the way to approach life. Be the eternal optimist who is excited to see what the next decade will bring. But unfortunately, the old timer wouldn't make it into the next decade with us. At the age of 91, T. Boone Pickens died of natural causes at his home in Dallas on September 11, 2019, seen off by his four children from the first marriage. In a final farewell to the world, he wrote one last letter filled with observations about life that pretty much sum up his entire character. It seems fitting to finish with a few of the very last Booneisms that T. Boone left behind. Although older people are generally threatened by chance, young people love me because I embrace change rather than running away from it. Change creates opportunity. Have faith both in spiritual matters and in humanity and in yourself. That faith will see you through the dark times we all navigate. And best of all, be humble. I've always believed the higher a monkey climbs in the tree, the more people below can see his ass. You don't have to be that monkey.